Well, um, I'm Joe Murphy. I've been in the compliance and ethics field for quite some time. Really started shortly after law school when I went to work for a company, part of the Bell System. And this was in 1976. And my responsibilities related to antitrust and antitrust compliance. So that was my first introduction to the compliance field on how you reach people, reach employees, so that they understood what the antitrust laws were and that they followed the rules and did the right thing. And I actually worked in-house for 20 years, which is really where I developed my thinking about uh, compliance and ethics. So in your earliest iteration of your career as, a, as an antitrust attorney, did you think about compliance as a kind of a practice of law or something different? Well, I started really focusing on antitrust as the subject, and I actually had exposures to some other risk areas. And I started thinking that compliance was different from the practice of law. And one of the things I realized, I had classmates from law school who were dealing with things like estate law, which had almost nothing in common with what I was doing, but that we were both considered lawyers. But somebody who did environmental compliance or regulatory compliance wouldn't think of themselves as being a compliance person, even though those of us doing compliance work in those areas had more in common with each other than the estate lawyer had with me. So it's relatively early on that I started seeing this as, hey, this is different. This is a practice of its own kind. It's different from just being a lawyer. Well, the thing that struck me about compliance in my experience in-house was discovering that within an organization, there were different groups, different constituencies, if you will. And in the old Bell system, the legal concern was monopolization. Were we doing things to improperly infringe competition? And I discovered that within the organization, there were groups whose focus, indeed their passion, was protecting competition, and championing the underdogs, the competitors. So their job was to make sure that the company treated them fairly, and they had a different orientation and motive than the salespeople whose job it was to sell and to beat the competition. And this fascinated me and really opened my thinking about organizations so that I could see the potential for establishing within an organization groups whose job it was to prevent and detect misconduct. And as it happened, part of my function was reviewing legislation, draft legislation in the, in the state legislature. And I was exposed to regulations on environment and started having some contact with environmental compliance. And that was when part of when I started thinking, hey, there's this common theme that runs throughout. But the most interesting discovery to me was this idea that corporations were not black boxes, they were not one uniform entity, but that you had different subgroups within that organization and that you could work with them. And I used to tell the compliance people that they were always the first call I returned if they contacted me on some issue. When did you start to think of yourself more as a compliance professional rather than as a practicing so in 1988, Jay Sigler and I published the first book on compliance. We had started doing the work on this maybe in 86. And so it allowed me to refine the ideas and bring them together and look more at this concept of compliance as a field um, of its own. You well, talked a little bit about experience at Bell, corporations aren't a black box, uh, that inside the corporation you can look out for the competitor rather than only pursue the sales drive or goals of the corporation. So now you're a, a decade into this stuff. What were some of those big uh, moments of awareness? Well, I would say that part of the development was recognition that effective compliance work was not about paper and preaching. 
It was not about having a code of conduct. It was not about lecturing people. It was about the use of the whole range of management techniques. And one of the things that I focused on early in this process was the role of incentives and making sure the incentive system was consistent with what we said our, our values and our code of conduct was. So that people were not just rewarded for making sales, but that also their commitment to compliance to doing the right thing was part of the assessment. And so, and you know, in hindsight, it can be difficult for me to maybe tease out all the different elements. But one of the things I do remember back from those days is in the old Bell system, the security organization had a publication that they put out that was extremely popular because it was all the stories of people who had done bad things and what happened to them. None of these stories had identifying information, but everybody read them. And later on, when we developed the compliance program, we, when I, this was now after the Bell system split up and we had Bell Atlantic, we put out a publication called Report on Integrity. And I told people, don't lecture. Nobody wants to read about the CEO telling you to do the right thing. So instead, we built on this model from the security organization and published actual war stories, all personal identifying information removed. And I told them, do not focus on the workers. Everybody knows you discipline the workers. Include the managers. Include the senior people. And in all the surveys we did, this was the most popular communications vehicle. Another thing I saw early on is in compliance, there was a company called Commonwealth Films that introduced the first docudrama to be used for compliance purposes. It was an antitrust video called The Price. And it was very effective because it used the story technique. So early on in my compliance training, I used that also. And, and part of what I realized was you have to be where the people are. You can't just have your own idea of um, telling people about the law. You had to do things that really related to people and they could connect with. And we knew that the, the war stories worked because it gave us credibility. So these were all discoveries that were built on bit by bit. Um, I also did field training, which was one of my favorite things, getting out of headquarters, going into the field, sitting with the salespeople. And so I also learned when you were training salespeople on antitrust, you had to be as aggressive as the most aggressive person in the audience. And so we might have someone say, well, why do we have to do this? The competition doesn't. And I'd get all excited. I'd say, well, tell me what the competition does, because as much as I want to defend the company, I want to, I want to sue the competitors, too. So you learned, again, that the, one of the keys for compliance was to be interactive with the audience. It's not something we just send it out on a wing and a prayer and hope that people pay attention. You've got to be out in the field talking with people, working with people, and I think the most important lessons I learned about compliance were going out to remote sales locations and talking with people where if a salesman said to you, what if I said this to the customer? What they mean is, as soon as this training session is over, they're going out and meeting with a customer. You better have the right answer, and you better have it right now, and it better be credible. Did you ever do more, include more stories about people who did the right thing? <coughs> oh, who did the right thing? Well, you know, thank you. This is a wonderful lead-up question. Did we ever do stories on people who did the right thing? And absolutely we did. I'm a big believer in incentives and recognition. And we, we did include stories of people who did the right thing. Um, we included them in presentations. And I am a big champion of using incentives in compliance programs. And to me, the easiest incentive is for the compliance officer to recognize someone who, in fact, did the right thing and make a big deal of it. And something as simple as writing a letter to the person saying, thank you for doing this, and sending a copy to their boss. And the story that I use, that I've heard more than once, is the salespeople who receives mysteriously in the mail or by email confidential information about a competitor, doesn't use it, and reports it. And in each case I'm familiar with, they follow, the company followed this model of having a recognition letter, a congratulations, great job letter, 
sent to the person with a copy to their boss. And I am sure that when that person's evaluation came up that year, they were recognized. And, you know, one of the big issues in compliance is culture. These types of stories help make the culture. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what culture means or how dynamic culture is, but the stories help create the culture. And so the question about do we publicize when people do things right is it's a very good point because doing that helps mold the culture. So do the war stories about managers being disciplined for doing the wrong thing, but the positives are also extremely important. Well, there, there is that question of whether you should offer bounties to people who call the helpline. There's a separate question about what's the definition of an incentive. An incentive is what's recognized in your organization. I've had a lot of experience with nonprofits. There's no money involved, but people do appreciate the recognition. So there are many ways to do rewards. But the most controversial is whether companies should pay bounties. And on that one, I would say you better know your culture very well before you touch that one. One of the counterpoints is some studies that show that when you convert doing the right thing because it's the right thing to doing the right thing because you're paid money, you kind of flip a switch on people and they're just as inclined to do the wrong thing. The classic story you hear about is you hear is about a, oh, I guess it was a babysitting place where they were having trouble getting parents to come on time and pick up their kids. So they started charging if people came late, and more people started coming late because they switched it from a moral question to an economic question. So I basically do not believe in companies giving the rewards. I see the benefit from the SEC doing it, but I do not believe in companies doing it. You will get more people doing this because it's the right thing. And if you want people to call, there's two things you have to do. One is you have to make it clear that you'll take efforts to prevent retaliation. But the most important thing is to show that you listen and you act. People will take the risk of retaliation if they think it's going to get a result. But if they think you're not going to act on it, they're not going to take that risk. So if you want people to call, make it clear that you listen. And so every employee in the company should be to say, yeah, we have a compliance program, and man, they act. When you call and report something, you see results from them. That's dynamite. We've heard stories of CEOs who have said the compensation program that they offer for their staff should never be influenced by either moral judgment or ethical action because they say everyone's got to do the right thing. We'll knock you down. We'll limit compensation rewards of any kind. We're doing the wrong thing. But we don't pay you to do what we expect of you. What do you think about that? Well, there's an interesting question when you're talking about incentives, whether you're talking about incentives for being ethical. I'm not that good at judging people. I can't just look at somebody and tell what's in their head. So I judge by what they do. And that is judged on what they do as a manager. That's not difficult to judge. You can talk with someone's people, for example. If they say, yeah, you know, when you ask the boss a question, he's got a copy of the code right there. He picks it up and looks at it. That's dynamite. That's something you can reward. The boss gets all of her people into the training, sits in the training, and asks the group questions about the training. You can measure that. That's the kind of thing you want to promote. You're not measuring somebody's ethics. You're measuring their management activities and their management skills to promote compliance and ethics. It's a very different thing from measuring somebody's inherent values. And not only is it not difficult, it's actually easy to measure. It's as easy to measure as any of the things that I used to have to measure subordinates on when I was in-house, like commitment to the company's mission and leadership ability you tell me which is more difficult to measure, somebody's leadership ability or their commitment to the compliance program and their efforts to promote the compliance program. So that's a, that, to me, is a false narrative for the bosses to say, no, we can't measure ethics, therefore we're not going to use incentives. Talk to us a little bit about your thinking about how good compliance is a reflection of 
question of good management practice? Well, there's an interesting question of compliance being a good measure of management practices because compliance is the use of management techniques to get results, to get people to do the right thing. So if you know how to manage people effectively, in, the, in essence, you know how to do compliance effectively because it really is the same thing. We sometimes get the question, does compliance work? I think that's absurd. To me, it's the same as saying, does management work? Ask somebody that question, ask them, does management work? They'll look at you like you're crazy. Does management work? Well, if you have good managers and they use good techniques, yeah. If you have bad managers and you use bad techniques, no, it doesn't. The same is true with the compliance effort. If you apply good management techniques to it and you're good at doing that, it will work because it's the application of management. I want to go back a little bit. And we talked about um, being present in the field. I think you've got, I'm going to plant a couple of ideas. You tell some stories from your bell days about sitting with someone in an operator's seat or on a line. Well, one training in the field, but sitting with and observing and doing the work of the, the majority of your employees. One of the things we had to do in the old bell system, uh, new lawyers and paralegals had to spend time out in the field. And of my 20 years in-house, my strongest memories are from those experiences. Sitting with an operator on position, sitting with a service rep, going out with an installer. It gives you insight into what's really happening in the business. And I would recommend to anybody in headquarters, especially compliance and ethics people, don't spend all your time talking with the executives. The executives are going to tell you how wonderful they are, how wonderful the company is, everything is great. They're going to tell you how great the culture is. Go out and talk with the employees. If you have drivers, ride with a driver. Do what's called a ride-along. Talk with the employees. Have lunch with them. Experience what they experience. That's the way to find out what's going on. And honestly, it's the way to measure culture. Many people in our field are captivated by surveys. I think surveys serve a purpose, but I have a lot less faith in them. I think it's very important to spend that time out in the field with the workers, with the people doing the day-to-day -day work. Maybe a little difficult now with so many people working from home, but you can still have breakfast or lunch with them and just talk and find out what's going on. Um, I think that's a critical piece. And I think any company, as a general matter, any company that has a workforce, whether it's sales or production, they should have all their headquarters people spend at least a little bit of time with the workers. Joe, why do organizations spend so much time creating and adopting codes of conduct? You've talked a lot about good management practices, being in the field, a practical knowledge of how that organization works, how it ticks. Why do we spend so much time on these very polished documents? That's an interesting question. Why do people spend so much time on codes of conduct? It reminds me a little story of a fellow walking along at night and he sees a street light up ahead. And there's a guy on the ground, inebriated, looking for something. And the passerby walks him and says, what are you looking for? And the guy says, I had this valuable watch and I lost it. And so the passerby gets down and looking, looking, looking. Finally, he says to the guy, where did you drop the watch? And the guy says, down that way. And the passerby says, why are we looking here? And the drunk says, because it's where the light is. Why do people focus on codes of conduct? Because it's easy. It's easy. I used to do presentations. Sometimes I do presentations to senior managers, although I prefer talking to workers. And I take out their code of conduct, and I dramatically put it in a seat. And I'd say, while I'm talking to you, watch the code of conduct. Let me know if it does anything. And the point is, a code of conduct is nothing but a tool. It is worthless unless it's used. And my favorite use for code of conduct is I want to see it on the desk of the CEO, open, dog-eared, and used. Then it has some value. And my friend Molly Painter Moreland made a very good point once. She said a company's real code of conduct is its budget. So that would be my story. They pay attention to codes of conduct because they're easy to get your hands around. You can really feel like you've accomplished something. Um, but if you do nothing with it, it's worth nothing. Could you tell us a little 
bit, uh, you were at the Bell, in the Bell system for what, over 20 years? Or it was 20 years. And then what did you do after that? Well, that's a, of course, also a good question. What did I do after the 20 years at Bell? And I went into practice with, uh, with Kirk Jordan. He had, at the time, the only law firm in the country to focus only on compliance and ethics. And so I did consulting. I um, was uh, responsible for the first practicing law institute program on compliance and ethics. Um, and we did um, advising companies on how to develop their programs. But then at about 99 or 98, Kirk got the idea that online training might be something that would be useful. This is a real application for this new thing then called the, the new thing, the Internet. And so we developed training. We did it a little differently. We relied on my experience in telling stories. And back then, you could not get video through the phone lines. You could get audio. And so what we discovered is if you showed pictures and you had audio, people's brains would convert it to video. We actually had an argument with a client who said they couldn't use this because it had video. And we said, there's no video in the thing. But I had the experience of being an actual capitalist. We developed a company. Uh, Kirk had the good sense to know we were not managers. So we brought in a fellow whose job it was, who we knew, to create companies. We built the thing up to 100 employees. 300 corporate accounts, headquarters in Waltham, with a European headquarters in, bless their hearts, Monaco. And then, according to plan, we sold a majority to a private equity group, and they and we, in turn, told the, sold the whole thing to SAI Global, which has made me a... I'm very fond of capitalism. So I'm thinking about your life. It's 90... You, you have just published the first book about compliance systems. Yeah. It's late 80s. I want to say that you had a role in the adoption of the first edition, at least, of the sentencing guidelines. Can you talk about that period, early 1990s? What's happening in the, in the space now called ethics and compliance? Well, to look at the history of the field, um, for quite some time, there was compliance focused on specific areas of the law. Um, actually going back to wartime production codes during World War II, antitrust compliance at, uh, infamously at, uh, at GE and Westinghouse, environmental compliance, EEO compliance, but they were always pigeonholed. In the 80s, we had the defense industry scandals and the formation of an industry group called the Defense Industry Initiative. It was still somewhat narrow, but the principles were broader. And DII adopted six principles, but they had a very important questionnaire that was fairly specific on compliance steps. For example, it was one of the first that also recognized incentives. Meanwhile, Congress adopted the, uh, the sentence, adopted the legislation creating the U.S. Sentencing Commission. The Sentencing Commission first adopted standards for individual penalties because what they found was farm shopping was rampant and one judge might throw you in prison for another. Another judge would set you out on probation. So they established standards. And then um, in the late 80s, they looked at standards for organizations and we're developing a set of guidelines for organizations. The initial approach was based on, well, how big does the fine have to be to deter, to deter misconduct? Um, but also about this time, when, when Jay and I came out with the book, um, I also wrote an article on, I think it was 12 Steps for State-of-the-Art Compliance Program. This got some good publicity. It was published in the American Corporate Council Association's publication. And when the ACCA submitted its comments in the Sentencing Commission, it actually attached my article to it. I can't say, oh, they read my article and were convinced, but it probably didn't hurt either. And so um, in 91, they came out with the draft guidelines, and Win Swenson, who really led the effort at the Sentencing Commission, also led the public effort to get people to learn about this. And I had the opportunity to meet Win, to talk with him, uh, we were starting a publication at Rutgers back then called Corporate Conduct Quarterly. 
we were able to use that to publicize the guidelines. So actually, a number of us in private practice work with the Sentencing Commission to promote these standards. Yeah. It, you know, it's an interesting question of how you go from individual misconduct, organizational misconduct. And this is something that we've struggled with for quite some time. Corporations are not big individuals, but they do exist. And so the corporation doesn't have an individual soul or heart, but individuals are not the same as organizations, and organizations are not just big human beings. So there have been different approaches in legal systems around the world. But what we have with the development of compliance and ethics is a, a kind of solution to this, that you look at the organization in terms of what it did from a management perspective to prevent and detect misconduct, and that's probably the best surrogate you have for analyzing companies and determining how to treat them. And really the best formula is one that looks at how bad the conduct was, whether it involves senior management, and compare it to how much did the company really do to prevent and detect misconduct. The easy case is one where you have one employee who covers up, does everything they can to avoid the controls, and engages in misconduct. The more difficult case is when if you have a compliance program and you still have senior executives involved. But it should always be along a spectrum of how far, how far do we measure this? How bad was the conduct? How much was the effort? Where was the corporation really? Was the corporation really trying to prevent this kind of stuff? Or was the compliance program just paper and preaching and not really worth that much? So that's kind of how the transition has worked. It's a more practical approach that also has the benefit of providing an incentive for companies to actually take steps to prevent misconduct. And I will say one of the most important elements of the standards today on compliance programs is the requirement that you evaluate what you're doing. A lot of people who summarize compliance programs, what they are, leave this point out, but it is so important. Any manager will tell you, whatever you do, look to see is it working, evaluate it. Every compliance program, every compliance and ethics effort should be evaluated. Talk with your people, see if it's working or see if it's not. Okay, well, there's an ongoing discussion about the relationship between ethics and compliance. A lot of it, in my opinion, it just gets too theoretical. My question is always, what works? Early on, when I was in-house, we recognized that just saying to people, obey the law, doesn't resonate with anyone. And also, as a lawyer, I don't see the lawyer as some dried-out, dead thing. I see the law as society's effort to deal with values and to prioritize values. I also see that values conflict one against the next. Loyalty is a value, but it can lead to a lot of misconduct. So early on, we said, hey, our effort in-house has got to be compliance and ethics, integrity. We use the word integrity to cover the whole field. You're not going to get very far if the only thing you're saying to people is obey the law because what some people are going to hear is don't get caught breaking the law. Get as close to the line as you can. And I think it was uh, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes who said if your objective is to get to as close to the line as possible, you're going to cross the line. And so that's how I see the value of ethics in this is that you're talking values and you recognize that the law deals with values. It deals with protecting people, protecting the economy, getting people not to cheat the government, not to bribe people, not to bribe government officials. These are all values. Law is not some dried out, dusty thing. It's the way society articulates and prioritizes its values. So my view is if you try to do a compliance program without ethics and values, you're just going in the wrong direction. If you just try to do ethics and values without recognizing the important role of the law, you're going to get into trouble. So it's real practical. It's not the least bit esoteric. It's how do you prevent companies from breaking the law? And honestly, we've not been that great at it. 
I hear lots of people say, we need to go beyond law into ethics. No. We need to get companies not to lie, cheat, and steal. We need to get universities not to lie, cheat, and steal. We need to get hospitals not to lie, cheat, and steal. It's a big job. It's never done. It can take all the effort and creativity that you have just to make sure that these big organizations don't hurt people. So what's your opinion about efforts by ethics and compliance professionals to also talk about the social responsibility of their organization, whether it's compliance with or support of sustainability goals, SDGs, or just um, as uh, Larry Fink talks about, the purpose of the corporation is more than just making money. What's okay. My, my role in com with compliance and ethics, first, I'm always worried that photo ops have a magnetism of their own. They draw people's time and attention. Which would you rather do, have to investigate a senior officer or spend time in front of pictures planting trees? So that's a major concern I have. It is not to say that the compliance and ethics organizations should completely divorce themselves from social responsibility issues because some of those issues are going to relate to the company doing the right thing and not breaking the law. But when it comes to more political types of things, um, there I think if the compliance and ethics person wants to do something, do it on their own time. Don't, their job is not to get the company to follow their political views. Their job is so that the company doesn't hurt people. And some of that will connect to social responsibility. I have no problem with the point that lines are blurry. As a lawyer, I'm very comfortable with that. So it's not that there's a strict line between compliance and ethics and social responsibility. It's that just I'm worried that the difficult work, if I have a choice between doing the hard work of compliance and ethics and disciplining people and auditing people, all the stuff where people don't want to see me, and doing something where everybody's smiling and saying, yay, great, this is wonderful, I'm going to avoid the hard work and do the stuff that's more fun. So in a real practical point of view, I want compliance and ethics people to do their jobs. It's a difficult job. It takes all the attention and energy they have. And if they want to do something on the weekends and the evenings, by all means, do it. But the first thing is do your job. And we're not doing great at it right now. There's too many areas where companies, organizations, universities, hospitals, they're still cheating the government. They're still hurting people. So that's kind of where I come out. I have nothing against social responsibility. It's just we have a very difficult job to do, and we need to do it. What do you do? How does one, when you're an ethics and compliance officer, how do you deal with a CEO or the top executive? Uh, really basically say, that's fine. You do your job, but then I'm then go on and do something else, which will be, shall we say, unequal, which will be questionable if not everything. I'm just thinking... Right now, right near Boeing, for example. How does, what, and I don't know the ethics officer at Boeing, but I would like to know, how, how do you operate in a company that goes uh, kind of left or right or wrong, whatever, whichever direction? Sure. It's, a, it's an excellent question, how you deal with, and I'll convert it to the senior management in the company who may not agree with the focus that you have. And there's a couple ways to slice this, but one point I would make is, People often speak in the collective. How do we reach the board? How do we reach senior management? In order to deal with the collective, you must deal with the individuals. There is no board or no management anywhere that it consists of identical people. Every group has a weak link. Every group has someone who will identify with you more. So my approach is no, don't think of the collective. Think of the individuals. What does each one of them need? What does each one of them look for? What does each one of them want from you? Which is the first one you can win over? So if there's 12 board members, three of them are from the company, figure out which one is most sympathetic to you. And figure out where people are coming from. Like somebody who's been in another company may have had to sit through the most boring compliance lectures ever, and they hate compliance. Well, you've got to tell that person, I hate boring lectures too. I want it to be really interesting, so you win that person over. So my perspective is don't be a compliance officer, be a salesperson. Learn from what salespeople do. Salespeople listen. Good ones listen. Listen to the CEO. Understand where she's coming from. Before you try to convince somebody else, listen to them. Understand what they want, and then see how you can meet what they want. I am not one who favors going to the board and saying, if you invest in compliance, you'll get a 15% return. You're setting yourself up. You will never match the return that the marketing and salespeople can get. You can say, yeah, if you do this, it'll help you financially. 
But you have to figure out where each of those individuals is coming from and then win them over. That's my perspective. Now, if you have a CEO who doesn't get it, the alternative is make sure your resume is in good shape and find another place. But I don't like that because the compliance person may be the last person standing between that CEO and planes crashing. And you have a responsibility to do what you can. And I will mention, one of my roles is at SCCE, the Society of Corporate Compliance and Ethics. And when I first got involved with them, I insisted, I really pushed them to have an ethics code. And in fact, this is something that, that Joan Dubinsky and I had had experience with in, in prior activities, promoting an ethics code for an ethics organization. At SCCE and HCCA, it was easy. They got it. And one of the things we put in that code is if you're a compliance officer, you don't sit around and give people advice when they come to you. It's an active responsibility. You have to do your best to prevent misconduct. And if you see something bad, you got to escalate it. I was always angry at the lawyer's code for, in corporate because it's kind of like, well, you should escalate it unless this and unless that. No. Something's going on. It's bad. You sh must take it up to the board. You must escalate it. No ambiguity. As soon as you put ambiguity in there, people will find an excuse for not doing it. It's must. And so I was seeing a case like that. If it's a CEO, you tell them, look, I'm bound by this ethics code, boss. I'd like to go along with you, but I can't. If you insist on doing this, I'm sorry. The board has told me what I must do. And by the way, Last year, there was a Delaware Supreme Court case that basically said, if you want to protect the board, the board needs a protocol requiring you, requiring you to report to them on these major issues. So I would say in that case, if it's the CEO and he's not going along, you, first you tell him, you don't go behind his back, you tell him, look, boss, I don't have any choice. If you want to go this route, I, I can't stop you, but I have to tell the board. I'd rather not, but I have to. I think the independence and the empowerment of the chief ethics and compliance officer is critical. One thing I would do, I would have a no-nonsense obligation from the board to the compliance officer to report. But here's another thing. We shouldn't get caught up in the formalities. Um, I remember Pat Nazzo talking about something where he was in a company where he would just say to the, the head of the audit committee, let's have lunch in the company cafeteria. And the chair of the audit committee would say, what do you want to talk about? And I think Pat would say, it doesn't matter. I think, and also if you look at um, the, um, the monitor's report in the Apple case, it was the same thing. You need the informal discussions with the chair of the audit committee. It shouldn't be a big deal where you call a board meeting and everybody's up in arms. It should be you email to, to the chairman of the audit committee. You have lunch with the person. You have breakfast. And everybody knows it. That's a wonderful thing. Another thing I would do, which is more formal, unusual in the United States, not unusual anyplace else, an employment contract that says the compliance and ethics officer can't be fired except by the board. And if the compliance and ethics officer leaves for any reason, he or she must give a report to the board on why. So I would build in those types of protections. Um, also making sure that the person has authority. And more and more, when you look at compliance program standards around the world from different governments, they're, they've really gotten wise to this. You see much more of that of these couple in key elements, independence and authority. You also see a point that Donna Bohm has made about line of sight that you have access to and line of sight into all different parts of the organization. Think back for a moment about your career. Who are some of the people that you relied upon? When did you reach out for help? What about the role about a, a budding set of either academics, services or resources, consultants, and professional associations? Well, in terms of going outside, um, 
recognize, and I was very early in this, so there weren't, it wasn't like I could go to some outside expert on compliance and ethics. Although I did um, meet and communicate with Mike Hoffman, who was one of the pioneers. Um, but the networking was critical. And early on in telecommunications, we formed an industry practices group. We, we actually called ourselves the compliance and ethics support group because one of us would call the other and say, is it management or is it me? Am I going nuts or are they doing such and such? And the person on the other side of the line would always say, yeah, I had that same thing and here's what I did. Networking was always important in compliance and ethics. And the Sentencing Commission, to its enormous credit, built that into the sentencing guidelines by saying your program needs to be at least as good as industry practice. And this, in part, drew on the experience of the Defense Industry Initiative. But it's critical for compliance and ethics people to be able to network, to be able to go to outsiders. And it's funny, one of the things I did as a consultant, I would come in and give the same advice to management that the in-house person was giving, except that they were paying me a lot of money and therefore they listened to me. I'm going to give a flip answer to this. There is something I wish I had done earlier. For the last 22 years, I've been a ballroom dancer. I wish I had started it earlier. But I do take credit as the founder, the chief cha-cha officer of the Society of Dancing Compliance and Ethics Professionals. I share this credit with Bill D. in Australia. And we, we decided we were going to do this. And then we waited about 10 years before we actually started it. I would say for somebody looking into this field, from a knowledge perspective, it's good to know something about some areas of the law. Um, it's very important to know management. And I would say there are two skills that are often overlooked that are very helpful. One is public speaking. Study it. Learn it. The other is listening. Learn how to listen. I heard a very clever definition of what most people mean. Most people mean the thinking of what they're going to say as soon as you stop talking. But I learned this doing investigations where people would tell me things that I, I couldn't believe they were telling me, but they told me because I was listening. I was taking notes and I was asking them. It's actually much more, it's a more difficult skill than it seems to be, but it's a very important one. And people, people wait to see if you're listening to them before they listen to you. And as a compliance person, you need to be able to convince people to do things. That means you need to listen. You need to know what's going on in the company. You will not get that answer from surveys. I am very sorry. You will not get it from surveys. You need to talk with people, and you need to listen to them. So I would say those two things, public speaking as a practical matter, and listening. There's lots of knowledge things. There's lots of networking things. I would recommend being involved in an organization like SCCE, for example. But in terms of skills, uh, that understanding management and how to manage people. Okay, what are, company, what are companies going to have to face in the future? I will make a prediction. I predict that even as we're focusing now on certain risk areas, there's another wave coming along. I don't know what it is. I just know there's always another one. Compliance and ethics people are going to have to deal with privacy. And one of the issues they're going to have to deal with, and I wrote an article in the, in the Rutgers University Law Review about this, the legal system is not as friendly to compliance as we might think it is. I predict that this new generation of privacy laws will be used to undercut compliance efforts. You will find people trying to interfere with internal investigations, interfere with due diligence, and these privacy laws, the penalties are so high 
and the language is so ambiguous, I predict they will be used this way because even the weaker European laws were used for this purpose, for example, to undercut helplines and to undercut the ability of employees to report on their bosses. So I would say always watch the legal system, always watch new developments to see how they might undercut what we're doing, and then don't be quiet, don't be passive, don't accept stupid things. Get out there in the political environment, push it. We need a lot more examination and pushback on the uh, aggressive use of privacy laws or we're going to pay for it in having our work undercut. Ah, people who've had any... Well, I've really worked with some um, excellent people over the years. Uh, my experience with SCCE has been very good, um, particularly the head of SCCE, Roy Snell, who was one of the most um, entrepreneurial people I've ever worked with. The people who worked with me, Jay Sigler, when we, we wrote the first book together, um, Kirk Jordan, and uh, a very much a can-do attitude of... Um, and Kirk was also very calming and talking with people, very reasonable. Uh, Jeff Kaplan and Rebecca Walker are uh, just excellent in this field. So I've had the good fortune to work with some really excellent people. Uh, John Braithwaite in Australia, brilliant scholar, brilliant scholar. Uh, Bill D. there, um, Javier Tapia in Chile, Shin J. Kim in Brazil. Um, my, my friends at the Competition Bureau in Canada. I could go on and on with this. There are really a lot of very good people um, uh, working in this field uh, around the world. And has it gone from an American, American sort of uh, approach to global? Or, or is it just well, that, that's an image we have that it was strictly American when in fact it wasn't. There was a lot of leadership in, uh, in Australia, which is why I connected with John Braithwaite. John did one of the first empirically valid studies related to compliance. It was on safety. And John started with the thesis that the more money you put into safety, the better the result. And unlike most social scientists, he disproved his own thesis. He reached the conclusion that it was the clout of the safety people, not the resources, that made the difference. And it was partly on that finding that I developed my own theory about the importance of the clout uh, of the chief compliance officer. But he actually did empirical research. There was a lot of the work done there. There was a little bit of work done on due diligence as a defense for boards of directors when there was corporate misconduct. So while much of the genesis was in the U.S., it never really was just American. That never really would have made sense to, for it to be that way, given that it was about um, management activity. Well, when I look around the world, there are some there are fairly good number of examples. I could also critique them all, but in Australia, they push very hard in the development of compliance and ethics. Um, Brazil, uh, my friend Shin J. Kim has really helped lead that. And in fact, at the Society of Corporate Compliance and Ethics, of their membership numbers, the second largest number, first is U.S., second is Brazil. So Brazil has gone quite some distance in embracing the field of compliance and ethics. They have a law called the Clean Companies Act that provides a defense based on that. And actually the people who worked on that all attended SCCE seminars held in Sao Paulo. Um, so there's been really, uh, really good work there. Um, the Canadian Competition Bureau, they've done great work. Um, I, I should acknowledge I was a paid consultant for them. And of course, I'm very fond of anyone who follows my own advice. Uh, but I think they've done, a, they've done good work as well. So there are a number of really good models around the world. And I would say this, if you operate around the world, don't be arrogant. Don't assume that what you bring from the U.S. is the only set of standards. We have very good standards, but look at what they do elsewhere. And I'll give you one example. In Australia, a standard compliance program is expected to include not only an employee helpline, but a line that customers can use to raise issues. You don't see that so much in the U.S., but it's inherent in the systems in Australia.